So if you think you've got um, in the skin microbiota, it's actually affected by body sites. You've got moist, sebaceous, like your face, and then dry. So moist is sort of groin areas and armpit. And then you've got sebaceous, like your face, and then you've got dry, which is sort of like the rest of your body. And it's really interesting how the microbiota, so the bugs that live in those different places are actually completely different. And, and during puberty, the, the, your skin and your face changes and becomes sebaceous. And that's why kids aren't really affected with acne because it's effectively a dry area and it's got dry um, bacteria that live on it. So as it changes and as those hormones during, pregnant, um, during puberty change and you have that drive to increase the sebaceous production, that that then creates a, an area a, a sort of conditions that help the, the acne bacteria to thrive and that's what causes it doctor's kitchen recipes health lifestyle harriet it's great to have you back on the pod again we, your episode on fertility uh was super super popular and uh, obviously your articles as well that you write on the website and your website as well uh are, are awesome like thoroughly well researched and everyone's so super popular so great to have you back have oh, you been? such a pleasure thank you so much for inviting me back cool cool of course of course and you've got um your own podcast obviously you've got the headphones and the mic and everything now so you're a bit of a podcast aficionado yourself How, how's it been uh, starting your own um it's been really good i've really enjoyed it actually thank you um i did my first series which um actually got into the top five uk nutrition podcast i was delighted and there I've got you some go. Great guests uh, for my second series. So, um, Louise Newson and Kimberly Wilson, lots of really interesting people. So, I'm really looking forward to to releasing that soon. So, watch the space and have you on it as well soon. <laughs> yeah, in the not so distant yeah. future. Yeah, no, absolutely. I uh, I will I'll for sure make uh, an appearance on it um, if you have me. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, cool. So we're going to talk about one of the articles that are, is on the website that you've um, you've written. Um, it's all about skin, um, but we're going to dive into a couple of topics. So. We'll talk about acne, um, atopic uh, skin conditions, uh, psoriasis, and obviously collagen, something that we are asked about quite a bit. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we start with um, with acne itself? What, what, what do we mean by acne? Um, I think everyone kind of knows what acne is, but there, there are a bunch of different types. Um, so so how, how do we approach acne from a sort of medical perspective, first of all? Um, so acne, there are lots of different types, but the main one I'm going to talk about is acne vulgaris, and that affects up to 90% of teenagers. And we don't really know quite why it happens, but um, but there are some certainly some pretty decent theories out there. And the first of all is that you've got sort of three primary factors that are implicated. So you've got the sebum over secretion, so it's sort of oily greasiness. And then you've got these cells called keratinocytes, which are part of your normal skin, they um, act abnormally, so they desquamate and they, they obstruct the ducts in the skin. And then you've got superimposed inflammation, which is mediated by bacteria. And that's either called Propiobacterium acne or Cutibacterium acne. It's recently changed its name. So uh, it's probably more likely to see it as Cutibacterium acne. And it's all thought that those sort of things together um, cause acne. And um, obviously it sort of commonly affects those teenagers. And that's thought really because at puberty you've got activation of those sebaceous glands from your hormones which causes an increase in sebum production and then actually that changes the microbiota of your skin so just in the same way that you've got all of those um, bugs in your gut you've actually got a whole pile of them on your skin as well and so that changes the makeup of um, changes the conditions and then changes which bacteria have dominance and so if you've got that that greasy sebum production it's the cutie bacterium acne then that thrive in those conditions and then cause the inflammation. So that's pro probably what happens. Um, and it's really interesting that that bacteria has a role in sort of inducing the inflammation and activating probably these other pathways, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute, but they are sort of IGF-1, MACK-K and NF-kappa B pathways. And that's sort of thought to be a sort of mechanistically plausible way that acne happens. Yeah, it, it seems like uh, the gut uh, and insert organ slash axis uh, is sort of being uh, discussed for, for everything these days. And, and, and in the article, you, you talk about this gut brain skin axis and 
and how there's the presence of uh, bacteria all over our body, all over the skin, I should say, in varying amounts. And according to different life cycles as well, it can change. Um, is there something unique during puberty um, where we can see the, the differentiation of the different species at, at that particular time? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, well, first of all, if you think of the, the bugs in your skin are actually, um, they're different according, on, according to different places. So if you think you've got, um, in the skin microbiota, it's actually affected by body sites. You've got moist, sebaceous like your face and then dry so moist is sort of groin areas and armpit and then you've got sebaceous like your face and then you've got dry which is sort of like the rest of your body and it's really interesting how the microbiota so the bugs that live in those different places are actually completely different and and during puberty the, the your skin and your face changes and becomes sebaceous and that's why kids aren't really affected with acne because it's effectively a dry area and it's got dry um, bacteria that live on it so as it changes and as those hormones during pregnant um, during puberty change and you have that drive to increase the sebaceous production that that then creates a, an area a, a sort of conditions that help the the acne bacteria to thrive and that's what causes it and so it's really interesting then that you've got you know if you think of why acne forms on your face it's because that's the area where it's sebaceous we mm -hmm. think that's where cutaneous bacteria acne is thriving it's not thriving on other areas because it's not sebaceous it thrives on your face your your chest and your back mainly your face but for example you don't get acne on your arms because it's a dry area or you don't get it in your axilla normally or your groin because they are moist and they've got different bacteria so it's really interesting how it does seem to be uh, really important what your species of bacteria you know, what bacteria are growing as to how you know if your susceptibility to acne yeah I, mean, I think most people might be forgiven for thinking of acne as purely an aesthetic problem that's something that you grow out of but this is something that covers you know it can create a lot of uh, psychological distress I mean certainly when I was a teenager I had really bad acne um really bad and to the point where I can't believe I'm admitting this but I, I would actually um I would put makeup on my, on my skin to hide just how bad it was when I went to school because I was so I, I was just so embarrassed by it and I, mean, I know a lot of uh, people go through it and stuff but for me it was it was particularly bad and I, I I've still got ice pick scarring I think because I didn't have the confidence to go to my GP at the time and actually speak to them about it and get treatment at the time because yeah I, I don't know I, just, I was just you know going through all the the changes and stuff and and finding out who I was as a person all the rest of it. but I've still got like um ice pick scarring um and and I, I guess you know we're going to talk about food and and uh, all the other lifestyle elements, but I wouldn't want to dissuade anyone from, from seeing their GP in their first instance to get um, treatment in the form of pharmaceuticals if they needed to. Absolutely. And I actually spoke to Dr. Justin Cluck, a consultant dermatologist who specializes in acne on my podcast. Mm -hmm. And we were talking exactly that about um, how much it's associated with, um, first of all, vanity and people thinking that, oh, it's just some spots, you know, why are you bothered about it? Or why do you, should you get treatment or, or coping with it? And about how much it really does affect people. And I have, um, I didn't suffer from acne, particularly as a teenager, but I have adult acne occasionally. And well, it's going through a quiescent phase at the moment, but it's really miserable. And I, you know, totally sympathize. Um, but one thing that's actually really interesting is that acne and anxiety and depression often coexist. And that's possibly not because having acne is so miserable, but because there's actually, uh, a, actually a link there between the gut brain skin axis mm. and that the psychological stresses, so we, stresses, you know, when you're stressed um, actually, can can impact the gut bacteria to produce different neurotransmitters so those are signaling molecules or they trigger but nearby uh enter endocrine cells to release neuropeptides and so that that may well lead to a change in intestinal permeability and that then means that toxins and bugs and um, partially digested food can all get into the bloodstream and they then seem to actually be um, deposited in the skin and cause inflammation and maybe cause acne. So this actually may well be a link, you know, sort of almost 
a cyclical thing that you know chicken and egg if you mm. if you're having psychological stresses maybe you're more likely to get acne and then therefore you may be more likely to be stressed by it because obviously it's pretty unpleasant and how do you really um how do you unpick that and resolve it it's, it's quite I think it's quite challenging and I think the more I understand about about the sort of microbiota both the gut and the skin and the respiratory I think yeah, how complex it is and how it's all interrelated and how um, it's just tiny changes can just put you completely out of balance and the wide ranging impact, you know, just your diet and changes in microbiome can have. Yeah, that, that's so wonderfully explained, you know, just thinking about all those different multifactorial processes that could lead to uh, acne or a whole bunch of other conditions, frankly. Um, mm. You mentioned intestinal permeability, sometimes colloquially referred to as leaky gut. If you mm -hmm. type in leaky gut into PubMed, you're not going to get anything. But if you type in intestinal uh, permeability or hyperpermeability, you'll, you'll probably find a lot more in the way of academic um, uh, literature on the subject. That for me is quite fascinating because, again, it all boils down to um, anything that impacts uh, uh, inflammation within the gut itself, so how you're nourishing your gut. Well, I'm jumping ahead a bit because we're going to start talking about foods and prebiotics and probiotics and, all, and the potential role for them as well. So um, I'm going to stop myself there. Well, before we go into uh, some of the, the dietary uh, adjuncts, um, treatment wise, uh, I know from a general practitioner's perspective, we try and uh, look at hygiene initially. Now, a lot of people might be thinking, you scrub harder, you get rid of that, that, off, that off bacteria, that's what's going to uh, resolve it that's not the case right <laughs> no and absolutely and acne as well is not caused because you haven't washed your face enough absolutely yeah. not um, sadly it'd be great if you could just wash your face a bit harder and it all washed away but actually really interesting that cutie bacterium acne actually forms like some other bacteria do a biofilm and they, they make this sort of self-made matrix of extracellular um, compounds so uh, substance which actually prevents um, antibacterial agents and you know your own anti-inflammatory cells coming in to disturb it and certainly that's seen on the skin it's seen with other bacteria in the in the you know in the lung pathology so it's it's not easy just to get rid of it and certainly scrubbing or you know certain agents um, you have to overcome that biofilm but um, there are anti-inflammatory and antibacterial topical agents like azelaic acid, um, isotretinin, and then you've got your um, antibiotics, which you're aiming to really kill that bacteria and, uh, and try to get rid of it. There are obviously some problems with, with these things, which is why you really need to speak to either your GP or you know, consult a dermatologist. Um, because one of the sort of downsides of antibiotics is that while you're reducing the, the, the bacteria that's causing or linked with acne, it does actually increase other species like Pseudomonas by quite a significant amount, you know, five to six times. And that's why you can sometimes actually get sort of associated folliculitis. So that's a, an infection of your, your hair follicles um, at the same time as having antibiotics. So while you're, you know, killing off or reducing your target um, bacteria other bacteria then have a chance to thrive and and they may not always be the ones you want um, so and and also you've got that sort of challenge of um, increasingly becoming resistant to certain types of antibiotics not just in you as an individual but as you know, you know global challenge that we are in increasingly seeing antibiotic resistance problems and that is is challenging so if there was a better way of maybe treating with, you know, certain um, sort of immunomodulatory you know, bacteria or probiotics or changing that skin microbiota in the future, you know, there'd be a really great treatment and, and would um, solve a huge and unmet need, I think. But we're, we're nowhere near that at the moment, but it would be great. Yeah, definitely. Um, with regard to uh, skin products, I, I mentioned sort of, you know, what I used to put on my skin and stuff. Is there um, evidence around the, the type of moisturizer particularly you should be using, i.e. one that doesn't block um, the natural pores that could lead to increased production of the sebum leading to acne, um, uh, particularly for, for teenagers or, or even in adulthood as well? Yeah, you should use a non, I think it's called comiod comiogenic, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. So it's a specific type that doesn't block your pores yeah. um, because greasy skin products that block um, Block your pores can increase your risk of you know can get the comedones, the blackheads forming more easily, and it trapping the 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 the, the acne bacteria yeah. you don't want. Yeah, yeah, 
Um, brilliant. Okay, let's let's get to dairy uh, and diet because I know <laughs> I know I'm, I'm I everyone always whenever something comes up on on Instagram or or social media, I'll give my response uh, and then somebody in the comments will say, just get rid of dairy. Just get rid of dairy. That's the issue for a lot of people. Uh, and it's not as simple as that, at least not from the research that we currently have. Um, and, and as we're, anyone who's been listening to the podcast is aware, you know, nutrition research is very, very difficult to draw conclusions from. So, um, but, but there is a potential mechanistic reason as to why dairy might be problematic for certain people. Um, so yeah, so let, 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 let's tackle dairy. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, you've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. It is really difficult to unpick this and think um, it's quite a nuanced topic, dairy. Um, I should say that the sort of the most comprehensive guidance on diet and acne comes from the 2016 American Academy of Dermatology guidelines. And they don't think there's enough evidence um, to suggest that you should give up dairy. So I think that I'll come with that statement first and then discuss mm sort of why dairy is important. So really dairy, when you break it down into amino acids, it promotes insulin secretion. Insulin, we, we know, drives the glucose into your cells where you can use it. Um, but it also is related to insulin um, growth factor like one uh, synthesis, so it's IGF-1 synthesis. And IGF-1 has a number of different roles. Um, so it influence it induces this other uh, pathway this other enzyme called foxo1 which senses cellular nutrition and that can trigger um, mTORC1 which is a governor of cell proliferation so that's how your cells reproduce how quickly they're turning over and also um, it can lead to sebaceous hyperplasia so by that the sebaceous glands those oily greasy those oil producing glands on your skin they can start um, getting bigger and producing more oil so that may be um, one factor it also IGF-1 stimulates follicular growth and keratinization all thought to be related to acne and androgen hormone production which uh, again related to acne which is why um, women with PCOS so polycystic ovarian syndrome are at higher risk of acne because they've got higher androgen hormones mm. um, and then all of those factors together um, are, are sort of form really a mechanistically plausible explanation as to why if you having anything that's raising your IGF-1 um, you may well increase your risk of, of acne and there's some studies that support that so they've shown that in people with uh, polymorphisms of IGF-1 um, so that means small genetic changes not mutations but just small genetic changes in IGF-1 are actually associated with acne and, um, and they've looked at plasma levels of IGF-1 um, in, a, in a small study of just 80 people. And they looked and they found that actually uh, the levels of IGF-1 correlated with the severity of acne. So all of that together does sort of form this sort of mechanistically plausible explanation. Um, and, and then milk also not only is the sort of the breakdown of the amino acids driving um, IGF-1 synthesis in your own body, but it also contains bovine IGF-1 and dihydrotestosterone DHT, which is a precursor of IGF-1 as well. Mm. So you can see then that you've got your own endogenous production of IGF-1, the exogenous bovine um, IGF-1, and it's uh, you know the precursor, and why therefore um, it's possible that, that dairy does impact it. So there've been a number of studies that have tried to sort of see if that really does happen in the real world. And one of them is a Cochrane review and Cochrane review being, you know, one of the, the highest forms of evidence really is a huge meta-analysis looking at lots of randomized control trials, trying to put it all together and work out what the, what the outcome is. And they did find that dairy, especially skimmed milk um, did increase acne, but a number of the trials really were not very rigorous. And, and so actually it's quite difficult to draw firm conclusions from it. A number of other studies have found um, a link with, with milk, but not with yogurt and cheese. Maybe there's a soluble, fat-soluble protective factor, or maybe it's just that all dairy has a negative effect. It just wasn't picked up on mm. that study. And then there's another meta-analysis um, that partially overlapped with the Cochrane, so it included some of the same studies, and they found that all dairy increased acne. Um, again, whey powder is part of the building blocks of dairy, um, has been found to sort of induce truncal acne in bodybuilders. So I think my take home messages from it is that if you have acne, 
have a trial of dairy free you know for a couple of months and see if it works for you if it doesn't it doesn't and if it does you know happy days um and i think um it's quite easy to give up dairy now and change over onto a plant-based alternative i will just say at that point please don't choose organic plant-based alternatives <laughs> choose the ones that are fortified with calcium and iodine um and and you know have a get your you know protein and calcium from from other sources your iodine from other sources so it's perfectly easy now there's lots of produce to do that um and i, th I think it's worth it an individual you know a trial at an individual level yeah definitely it's it's super easy i, I guess these days to get those plant milks but iodine like you mentioned is is super important because even though milk isn't the best source of iodine it's the most common source of iodine in people's diets at least in the uk anyway because yeah. uh, of some of the agricultural methods and certainly touching on the podcast that we did before on fertility that's super important um thinking about iodine uh, mm. intake right yeah absolutely and um you know you can get iodine from fish but if you're vegetarian vegan um you know it's a bit more challenging yeah is there a um a, a suggestion that the sugars in certain um, milk products are also exacerbating I, I suppose this touches on the, the next point about westernized diets and uh, uh diets that contain a lot of highly refined sugars and, and carbohydrates and um is there a suggestion that it's the milk that the, the milk sugar specifically that could be activating these pathways or is that uh, a separate I don't so think I mean. that anyone knows that. I think it's thought that the amino acid breakdown mm. stimulates the IGF-1, but also, you know, there've been other studies that have looked at, for example, chocolate and jelly beans. Um, and they did a small chocolate crossover study beans. with that. Love it. <laughs> and, looked, and they found that the chocolate did increase the acne, but was that, that was milk chocolate. Was that the milk in it or was that, because the, the jelly beans didn't increase acne and that's the sugar, right? So mm. um, what was it in dairy? or was it dairy or was it chocolate so i you know i don't think we really understand that yet and i don't so i, th I think it's probably not the sugar it's probably you know the igf1 production but um but coming back to then westernized diets you know they are high fat uh, high refined carbs um and low fiber and certainly all of those things increase the IGF-1 signaling and also altered retinoid signaling. And you just don't see acne in people with low GI diets, say, for example, like Papua New Guinea or somewhere, people don't have acne. And is that related then to um, the fact that they are eating low processed, uh, you know, raw, uh, whole food uh, with high fiber, low GI that that's what their diet contains um so it's probably that you've got that high fat high fiber uh sorry high fat high dairy low fiber as well may well be disturbing your microbiota mm. and we know we've just been talking about how microbiota impacts the skin so all you need to do is shift your microbiota and then you um, change your intestinal permeability you let all of those things in and that gets deposited in the skin which can then lead to inflammation so it's it's quite a sort of subtle interplay and really quite complicated and it's probably not just one single factor it's probably all of these factors and yeah. it might be that actually it's not dairy per se but it's about having a diet that is you know low gi so whole grains and fruit and veg and antioxidants and you know fermented food nurturing your your gut health that allows you to have dairy or allows you to have the occasional you know piece of junk food because actually your diet is so good otherwise that your micro your gut health is good which helps your skin health so it's difficult to unpick it all at the moment i think yeah yeah i think that's such a good point because when you when you think about what a westernized diet is it's got so many attributes that could be problematic mm. the high sugar the high fat uh you've got uh, the abundant source of those branch chain amino acids as well that we're talking about that could be driving uh acne um and I'll be honest, I don't know too much about the dietary habits of the Papua New Guineans, but I imagine it's probably better than us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it relatively low in protein as well? Um, I think, I don't think it's low in protein. I think it's, as far as I'm aware, I'm not a Papua New Guinea diet. Expert, <laughs> so, uh, I think it's just the fact that it's low, pro, you know, it's, they're not eating processed food. But as you say, is it, if you go back to sort of Western diet, 
is it the fact that it's the dairy causing this or is it mm. because of the IGF-1 route or is it um, the carbohydrates causing the IGF-1 or is it that the combination of all those things are knocking off your gut microbiota? So, or is it a combination of all of those things? Yeah. But I think in, you know, Papua New Guinea, you're not going to be, you're going to be on, you know, high GI, unprocessed, you know, lean meat. Uh, it's going to have a totally different diet. And it's which of those factors is, which of those factors is preventative for acne, is protective. Yeah. Possibly them all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So a low GI diet, high in fiber, lots of roughage, certainly going to be improving your microbiome and you're not going to be having uh, as many McDonald's or, or insert <laughs> fast food chain uh, meal. Um, and also you've got omega-3 as well, if you think about it, you know, that's sort of the Western diet best. It's like Papua New Guinea, you've got your yeah. high omega-6, high low omega-3 in your Western diet, which is pro-inflammatory mm. where versus a healthier diet would be high omega-3, low omega-6 so an omega-3 actually decreases igf one so you can see how it's involved and in, possibly involved in the mechanism um but they're just not enough studies to support at the moment whether i say taking an omega-3 supplement would help but um certainly an interesting thing for the future and then um antioxidants i think it's fascinating that lower vitamin a and e was found in people with acne now is that chicken or egg you know it's really interesting um but topical antioxidants like in green tea have been found in animal studies to actually um, sort of feed into these pathways so one of them is one proliferation pathway is mTOR and so actually did have an impact on mTOR but you know who knows sort of talking I know that we've talked a bit before about animal models and things but um, so this is if you put if you're dropping something like green tea uh, on the cells in a petri dish that's your sort of cellular uh, model of it it's a very very long way from a human and i think you know we need to exercise caution in those but as with any of these things fruit and vegetables antioxidants polyphenols they're going to you know help you yeah actually i think that's a nice uh, point to do a little sidebar there about how we translate research from a laboratory environment like that where you're literally dropping uh, a solution onto a bunch of cells that you put in a petri dish versus consuming said products uh, either as a supplement, a nutraceutical, or as part of your diet, and actually having that effect, uh, it, you know, on you. That's actually clinically um, relevant. Um, you've done a PhD. You've uh, you've seen both sides of it, and you're a frontline uh, uh, doctor as well uh, as being a nutritionist. So, why don't you talk us through like? how big a difference that is between the lab and what you put on your plate or what you take in a, in a pill. Sure. So I have to say that um, even though I was an academic clinical fellow, so an academic doctor and had done time in the lab and things, it wasn't really until I did my PhD that I actually understood this. And so mm. I think, you know, for the, for, for most doctors or a lay person, it's actually quite hard understanding all of these different things and why they're used and the pros and cons with them. So if I just sort of break down what the different models are, and I use the word model because um, it's a sort of a way of testing out a theory. So you're in science, you're always trying to test out that theory, you know, asking a question, um, is your theory right or not? So the easiest way to, to look at something um, is by growing cells in a dish, and that's your in vitro method. And um, it's actually really quite hard to grow cells. If you just, if I took skin punch biopsy from you and try to grow your cells in a dish, it's actually really quite hard. And it's only recently that people have got a bit better at it and they're now able to, to, to do a bit better. But for a long time, um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute, but for a long time, people have used what's called cell lines. And that's where they sort of immortalized cells that carry on growing and um, are happy to grow in plastic. And uh, one example of those is famous called HeLa cells. And that's actually from one woman called Henrietta Lacks. And those are her cervical cells. I mean, you know, most cell lines now are contaminated at some point with, by HeLa. So you've really got to know um, what you're growing, the fact that it's happy growing on plastic, because most cell lines, you put the cell on plastic and it just gets off not growing on that and won't grow. So you've got to make sure that uh, your cell grows and it's, it's happy growing and you give it the right conditions. So you feed it with some media, you keep it nice and warm and you give it some oxygen. 
And it's really important that every now and again, you actually check that you know what you're growing because you can't tell down a microscope what it is. It could actually be anything. And as I just said, lots of cell lines get contaminated. You know, it's really easy just to, to get a cell in the wrong place. Um, and those, those, that sort of tissue culture it's called, um, is actually really different from, from our cells growing in the body because they've they've got totally different growth factors they're probably um they're not used to a 3d environment there's no extracellular signaling nothing and and so what information you can gather from that is actually really quite limited and that's why people more recently have sort of developed these ways of taking some cells from a primary culture so going back to like skin tissue biopsy or something and they're able to now grow them in the laboratory into these things called organoids and they're sort of like 3d structures um which almost which are better at mimicking uh, what's actually happening in your in your in your in your body but still you know there's no blood supply to them there's no you know there are no external factors or hormones yeah. or all the rest of it so it still is quite limited and then you've got um animal models and although you know i think it's really difficult and challenging to think about testing on animals it is also you know the only way that we can test something is safe before you know we, we put it first in humans and drugs aren't always safe we need to you know test that they are first and um and so that's why you know animal studies are are done for to really forward the field of of, of medicine and, and try to cure people from you know all sorts of diseases cancer included so if you've got an animal model, you can either um, induce the disease in the animal, and we'll talk about that in psoriasis later, um, or you can um, take a bit of uh, tissue from something else like a human and put it in the animal and test it. Um, you can get a mouse and you can induce cancer, for example, or model of disease and then test it. The problem with that is that for example, radiation induced cancer is not the same as a cancer that just spontaneously occurs, mm -hmm. will have different genetics and, and so might not be the best model to test it. But in a, you know, it's, if you've got nothing else, then that's going to be your best model. So it does mm -hmm. still have its limitations. And then now you can do um, what's called knock in, knock out studies where you can actually specifically edit uh, even mice and um, put in a gene of interest, take out a gene of interest and see how that um, affects um, growth or a number of different characteristics or how they respond to drugs. And then right at the top of the tree, you've got your human, so in vitro studies and those are using healthy volunteers, mainly men, and they're testing um, molecules that have been tested on animals already. So you can see that going from that initial hypothesis, that initial question that you want to, to to test and to ask you've normally gone through cell lines or organoids and then you put it into a mouse model and then you've got it into a human and all the way through you're testing not just um does a equals b but you're testing well what about uh how can i can i do it in reverse can i do it in an orthogonal so an alter an alternative method to really be sure that the answer that i'm seeing is correct so you can see that to get to a human study actually takes years of research um, to get in all of those other other things lined up first so it's um it's very difficult and expensive to get there um and and also i think then sort of looking at reading papers it's really important to know that the difference between a, a study that was done in a human versus um, a topical application of something on a cell line um, is very different. And, and that uh, through all those sort of reasons I've just sort of outlined, I mean, Rita really exert a lot of caution. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, for, for folks listening or if they see a headline and they click to the paper and then you read the abstract maybe you don't read the whole paper you can get an idea of just how far along the down the, the chain uh the the relevant conclusion is by looking at where they tested this was this an animal model was this cell line was this in humans how large is that? and then you get into the nuances of the significance uh, the number of humans used and all this kind of stuff um so and just, just to give people an idea, I don't know whether you can actually put a number on this, but let's say you have a positive result in uh, a cell line. What's the likelihood that that's actually going to uh, elicit, you know, the creation of a drug or the use of a of a nutraceutical or some certain, certain supplement? What what's the likelihood that that's actually going to translate into something that's that's going to work? I can't give you a figure for that, but I can tell you that, say, for example. Um... Well, like 
doing my PhD that, you know, I found lots of positive things or positive things where uh, drug A did uh, have an effect on mm. our cell line, for example. But the, the problem is with it is that, first of all, if you think so, I I did it. My PhD was on osteosarcoma. So it's a rare form of bone cancer and it's actually really um, heterogeneous. So the genetics of it are really quite different in different people. Um, and so trying to study a disease like that is really quite difficult. And lots of diseases are like that. Um, you might be able to sort of divide them up into subtype or have a biomarker to sort of delineate groups and things. Um, but actually, then I didn't just use one cell line. I used a panel of 18 cell lines in order mm. to try to to represent the different, you know, a, a greater depth of the disease. So trying to find one drug then that actually had a significant effect in all of those cell lines I, I did find a couple of those um but then I I didn't I think if you're doing rigorous science you have to then work out quite the mechanism behind it and and test it in an orthogonal way so that's sort of you know coming at it from a different angle so while you might get an initial hit on a drug screen then trying to work out either a mechanistically plausible explanation for it or then testing it in a different way either with so I use like siRNA so that's all inhibitory RNA to knock different genes out um actually then a lot of the hits from your drug screen don't go anywhere mm. and then from that then if you actually find something that does work and then you put it into an animal you're still seeing quite often quite small gains even in the animal um it's quite hard to see an effect as i said you've got your radiation you so either your radiation induced osteosarcoma or your you can do um what's called you can uh, actually put some of the cell lines in or you can um so you're testing it like that into the mouse um so it's quite hard actually then to be sure that even if you do see something in the mouth, that it's actually relevant for the disease in the humans, because you're still quite limited to those cell lines mm. and your and the mouse model. So it's really hard at each step. You know, there's a significant drop off. And that's why research costs a huge amount of money, because there are so many dead ends. And um, it's it's really challenging to find those those, you know, next drugs, um, because you know, years worth of research has to go into to doing all of the, the background before you even see the drug and, you know, with your GP or, you know, whoever's prescribing it. Years and years, you know, 10 plus years normally have gone into that. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, you know, hopefully that will give people an idea of why it costs billions of pounds to do research into molecules, why there is a, a patent uh, legislation that gives drug companies, I think it's 17 years is the amount uh, of time that they have Um uh, uh, ownership uh, of, of, of said product um, and it's a really expensive business and we're going to come back to this actually because there's a bunch of other supplements that are readily available where that kind of rigor hasn't actually been uh, mm. uh, conducted because there's a way around because they can already sell the product um, because yeah. there's enough hype around it so but we'll, we'll leave that I think that's that's really interesting for, for people to understand just how molecules are created and, and how we uh, form those into drugs and, and the amount of research that goes into that. Let, let's bring it to atopic um, uh, psoriasis because this is where sort of your, your, your experience and research has had an effect. Um, first of all, what is psoriasis for, for people at home? Um, psoriasis is a sort of scaly skin condition or sort of a hyper proliferative skin, skin condition. Um, it's actually not that common. You've so hardly any children have it you see it more in in adults up to 10 percent and it's associated with immune activation but really the sort of mechanism of it is quite unclear mm. interestingly it's actually associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular syndrome and metabolic uh, cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome and it's now thought that you have altered gut microbiota um, that might impact and and cause some of this and so they've tested that using um, what's called um, imiquod, imiquod, I'll say that again. Imiquod. <laughs> so they tested that using imiquod, um, which is a toll like seven receptor agonist, and that's to induce a mouse model of this. And the topical IMQ actually then alters gut microbiota in mice and um, 
and it increases the marker of inflammation. It also increases the volume of their spleen, which is another sort of surrogate marker of, you know, that there's chronic inflammation going on as well. And it's their thought, thought that it's the gut, um, the gut issues that you've got, the sort of dysbiosis, this altered gut microbiota that then, as we talked about before, then leads to that leakiness and inflammation. And then you actually have the, the deposits of, of that leakiness and the stuff that's absorbed, the toxin, the, the partially broken down food and things into the skin. And that that then um, is related to um, psoriasis increase. But it's also that um, maybe bacteria now they don't quite know how this um, happens whether it's bacteria from the gut are traveling to the skin or whether it's the change in environment because of the inflammation in the gut leads to a change in inflammation a change in environment in the skin to then certain bacteria then flourish because mm. staph lentis is one of the bacteria here that's actually been seen in patients with psoriasis and may well be driving some of that so as part of the, that sort of study they did in the IMQ treated mice, they have found all of these changes. And interestingly, um, so one of the other things that's quite difficult to explain about keg pathways. So <laughs> keg pathways are um, it's like this massive database. And if you think of in the cell, you've got so many different cellular processes and proteins and trying to work out what on earth does what and how they all interlink and there are so many different pathways so keg have this amazing resource where you can sort of try to to really understand the, the molecular biology a bit more because you can see like a sort of metabolic pathway or a cardiovascular disease pathway or a growth pathway and how all of those proteins have linked together in a sequential fashion um, and it's at a sort of greater sort of more superficial understanding it's sort of like high level functioning of of cells really so they have um, did this, the, the people in the study that did this IMQ uh, model for the mice, they did um, what's called metagenomics on, on the mice. So they sequenced all of the, the DNA that they collected from the skin, from the psoriatic regions. And they actually found there was a difference in keg pathways and that actually the cardiovascular risk and metabolic disease pathways were, were, were different, which maybe then explains why psoriasis is linked with cardiovascular yeah. disease and metabolic syndrome so how it all links is actually i think incredibly fascinating yeah yeah definitely we didn't mention it with um with acne but i, I guess it's probably more pertinent here would, would there be a role for probiotics um and in, in, in the treatment of psoriasis other autoimmune conditions and, and skin disease I think that there probably is a role in the future. I th don't think that enough is known about it at the moment mm. um, and there aren't the studies to support that, but um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, you know, may well be something of the future. Yeah, It'd be interesting to see whether they're topical probiotics, yeah. or whether, you know, you're going to be taking gut to make microbiotics or, or quite, mm. you know, we think of respiratory conditions as well. I know that's a bit off topic, but will that be mm. nebulized probiotics? You know, it's yeah. really, prebiotics would prebiotics work better because there's so many there's so many sort of nuances to it all that um it's not just about increasing bacteria or specific strains necessarily it's about you know that um, alpha beat the diversity and also that cellular stu or studies have shown as well that say post antibiotics ha taking probiotics can actually prevent recolonization of your own yeah. gut so so how it i, I just think we we're such in such our infancy in all of this. We just need to know so much more information. Yeah, yeah, that that was actually flying in the face of what I thought would be a pragmatic decision um, to to take probiotics after having uh, some form of antibiotic therapy because you want to try and recolonize the gut. Mm. But it, uh, I, I can't remember the the mechanism whether it's uh, through creating a biofilm that prevents recolonization or I don't think like they that. know, but. There were two big, mm. two big studies published in Cell, you know, really high impact factor journals that showed mm. that um, the probiotics either did nothing post antibiotics or, pre or in about 30, 40 percent actually prevented recolonization. I think, you know, mm. it does naturally feel or, or certainly lots of clinicians have used them to think, oh, well, you know, it, it must help me. I'm replacing my probiotics, but if I'm replacing my bacteria, but if they are preventing reconstitution, then that's that's certainly a. A risk factor that I think that most people don't associate with probiotics or a supplement. You think that supplements are 
are actually good for you or and the worst they can do is waste your money on you know they're maybe expensive they're not going to harm you I think that's most people's view of supplements but then to think actually maybe this could be doing me some harm because it might be preventing my gut from reconstituting is is a bit more of a worry I think yeah and and like you just mentioned there you really have to take an orthogonal approach to uh how we utilize um probiotics as a treatment you know it's not just about the strain or the type it's about the formulation it's how you use it what the method of delivery is whether it's nebulized so for folks at mm. home that's uh, when you breathe it in um uh versus topical you know i'm already seeing a lot of probiotic preparations in the skin and beauty industry mm. uh being sort of uh, suggested as a way to prevent aging all the rest of it um I, I mean i haven't come across anything personally i haven't actually looked uh for for uh skin formulations and whether they're having any benefit i mean in the future maybe um but right now i'm kind of skeptical well i, th- I think it's a really interesting area for development and i think if you tag you know the words probiotic on it people think oh it must be by science or you know oh it must be must be good for you but actually that you know that well there's been some mouse studies which have shown that specific strains of bacteria actually um prevent uv damage and that can actually increase skin health increase like fur uh, the shininess and the thickness of fur all you know related to skin health so certainly skin bacteria and gut bugs do seem to have a, a massive role in um in aging and health prevention and, and healthy aging of skin and health of skin so maybe in the future probiotics will be a benefit but i just think that we don't know enough about what normal skin looks like what the you know what inter ethnicity and uh, inter ethnic variation inter geographic variation you know how does diet and um how do all of these other factors link before we can then start modulating stuff and that to me just feels like we just don't know anywhere near enough maybe these are the things of the future maybe we'll all be you know smearing we won't be using moisturizer anymore we'll be using our probiotics on our face who yeah. knows but i just yeah. feel we need more information yeah definitely i wonder if there's probiotic shampoos when you mentioned fur there i was like oh i wonder if any any uh savvy uh marketers probably. For probiotic the shampoo yeah probably yeah i'm sure you'll probably get uh pick that up after talking of aging uh so collagen uh collagen is uh super hot right now i feel like i'm bruno there it's <laughs> super hot right now um it's it, it's an interesting one because I'm getting asked about it a lot. I, I said to you last week, I don't know that much about it. I haven't really done much of a deep dive into it, but it's, um, I know obviously it's a, it's a factor of skin and, and during aging, you lose collagen as well as a whole bunch of elastic fibers uh, along, with the, uh, along with the synthesis of uh, hyaluronic acid. I always uh, get that pronunciation wrong, which is why you're, you, know, you, you see uh, beauty creams with hyaluronic acid in. Um, from my understanding, the only anti-aging claim you can make uh, for a product is if it's got uh, a significant amount of SP- SPF in um, to qualify for you know, the UV blocking um, uh, effects of a, of a cream, which has been shown to reduce aging. Uh, but collagen appears to have some potential benefits, I would say. I'm saying that tentatively. Uh, why don't we talk about what, what, what collagen uh preparations there are out there and uh and your your perspective on it so collagen yeah i agree i think it's a really interesting topic because it's actually really nuanced there it's just not clear um mm. so collagen is a large protein most of the supplements are you know oral you're taking those collagen supplements by mouth um and so when you ingest a protein it's digested and so broken down into smaller subunits and that's your um, peptides and amino acids before it can be absorbed so if you're eating that your supplement or you're having a piece of steak um, all of those proteins will be broken down into amino acids so first of all you have to think that anything you're taking in will be broken down and then it's quite hard to see then why it would be rebuilt specifically into collagen it, normally you know the body knows what it needs and it's synthesizing all sorts of different peptides and uh, you know proteins within the liver um why would it specifically reconstitute back into collagen and even if it did would it definitely travel to the skin hmm. so that's first of all sort of the question behind it the sort of mechanistic question there have been a couple you know a few studies that have looked at it and and actually found that with 
collagen supplementation, it has improved skin hydration and wrinkle count. Um, but I think they're quite subjective um, mm. markers and it's quite hard then you know, to draw conclusions. But possibly one of the more interesting studies actually analysed skin protein fluids, which I think is a more objective marker. And they did find yeah. that pro-collagen, fibrillin and elastin all actually increased. So I think it's quite difficult then to know what that means. Um, first of all, you don't know what the diet of these people was when they were taking it. There's no record of that at all in these studies. Um, mm. you know, how, how high quality was their protein intake? And secondly, just because you've got um, these proteins that are raised in, this, in your blood or skin fluid, does that mean that they're having an anti-aging effect? So studies have looked and they found sort of increased skin plumping and doesn't appear to be associated with side effects. So I think probably what you can what I take from this is that I really don't understand the mechanism at all, because it doesn't make sense to me that it'd be broken down. Why would it be resynthesized? But maybe it is. Maybe this, we don't understand that. And mm -hmm. if it is, then is it having an effect? I'm not sure. I'm not convinced. Um, I'm not convinced by the subjective element of these uh, the, the outcomes that they've used. They've used small studies. We don't know the diet. Mm -hmm. um, but it's probably safe. So if you probably the only downside here is cost. If you want mm. to out like, you know, spend your money on collagen supplements, it might help. Um, it might not. And it probably isn't going to do you any harm. But if it were me, I'd spend money on SPF 50 and I'd wear it every <laughs> single day, <laughs> yeah. which is what I do. As Caroline, I think Hiron says, if it's light enough to, to read a book, you should be wearing sunscreen. <laughs> that's, so that's, good like, advice that, there. <laughs> that's my take-home message there you go and was there a specific type of collagen that you found um was uh that would like a standout like the, the ones that I, I i looked at a couple of papers um and the ones that i've come across include collagen hydro hydro hydrolysate mm -hmm. collagen tripeptide and collagen dipeptide I don't know what forms they use, whether this was um, a marine based collagen, a bone growth collagen, like, you know, whether it's a supplemental form, whether it's a powder, like literally no idea. Um, but is, is there one that stands out? No, I think, I think that they're all really small studies. Mm. There's quite a lot of flaws in the studies and, um, and there are a range of different products. It's not known if there's a better one, uh, you know, uh, you know, what the, because we still just don't understand it if they're really, is a mechanistic link anyway um so it's impossible then to sort of work out from a mechanism point of view which one would be better and the studies don't suggest or point to to one being better or or one even being you know for sure that it does actually work as it's, it's you know i don't think any of these are grade one level evidence that you'd be you know really confident to say no this absolutely works anyway so it's they're small studies they're all quite flawed there's a range of different products i think you know it's almost like flip a coin and choose a collagen to be honest yeah and, and that you know that sort of comes back to how difficult it is to choose a what does a high quality supplement look like it's, yeah. it's almost impossible to tell i think a lot of the time yeah yeah totally i i i, I was laughing to myself because uh, some of the um the output measures uh, of the studies that i was looking at just i've never come across it before so there was uh, changes in visually assessed crow's feet scores mm -hmm. changes in skin wrinkling parameters skin roughness uh uh what was this uh smoothness depth like i i, I mean i yeah I, I don't know like how validated these scores are i'm sure you know maybe there are but it's just uh it just goes to show like how little we know about this and, and coming back to our previous discussion about your your phd and the translation of science from a cell line to a product that you can put into your shel shelves there's already enough hype around collagen longevity molecules that you you'll see being sold on the internet all the rest of it such that you don't need to do these rigorous studies because yeah. it's available and people will buy it so this is a multi-billion dollar industry already without having to put any of the research and development yeah absolutely it. um which is quite sad in a way i guess it is because i think we'll we'll actually never know if there's any benefit of collagen because no one will ever fund the study um mm. the one interesting thing about collagen is that it might actually help wound healing so if you're if you had an operation, I think that's the one time I'd recommend it, but the rest of the time, probably not. But yeah, absolutely. And just to go back to that. So um, 
how research is funded in the, in the UK is actually mainly due to charities. And that's really often according to which charitable groups have the, the loudest, you know, the loudest voice and the, and the biggest uh, you know, patient group and patient advocacy. And so lots of the smaller or less well-known diseases are often forgotten in that. Um, but charities make uh, you know, have a huge role. And for my, um, my PhD was funded by, um, by Bone Cancer Research Trust and also by Breast Cancer Now. Um, two charities that do a huge amount of work you know people out there running marathons funded my PhD my PhD cost you know at least 250,000 pounds I don't know the the, the final I'm sure that there was lots of you know extra bits of plastic you know tissues and bottles that you know maybe didn't quite get onto the final bill so I'm saying upwards of that you know that's a quarter of a million pounds and while you know I sort of pushed pushed forward the world of osteosarcoma a little bit you know I didn't find a cure for it and and um you can just see how expensive it is, how difficult it is. And that's three years of, you know, full-time research, you know, really trying to unpick all of those, those things and, and how difficult it is and, and why it takes time and costs lots of money. And if you are supporting charities, please go out there and carry on doing it because you really are the backbone of the research in the UK and it's so important. Absolutely. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, and I'm really glad you mentioned uh, the potential for uh, collagen research looking at recovery, because what, one thing that I, I think probably doesn't get enough attention, and I'd love to see people running marathons for it. Maybe maybe I will at some point if I ever do a full marathon. I've only done a half and that was horrible for me. Um, but pressure ulcers. So pressure ulcers and the breakdown of skin that we know happens very commonly, particularly to vulnerable elderly patients in hospital because of prolonged stays, as well as uh, sarcopenia, um, mm -hmm. you know, malnutrition, big issue. Um, whether collagen supplements could prevent pressure sores that lead to, you know, extended hospital stays as well as infections on the rest of it. That's what I would be really, really interested in. Um, and there has to be rigorous studies for uh, collagen to be uh, supplemented in, in those vulnerable groups as well. So. If you see me running a marathon, it'll probably be for pressure sores. <laughs> it's not very sexy, I know, but <laughs> just sort of talking back then about hospital and patients and things. I think this is like absolutely incredible how I'm gonna stick myself out on a limb here. Having so having worked in hospitals for you know well over a decade, I know that the food in many of them is perhaps not quite what you'd like it to be. And that the more and more we know about how the gut health you know when was the last time you saw fermented food on a menu in mm -hmm. a hospital you know I know as a as a you know staff member the food was you know it was pretty fast food a lot of the time it wasn't you know take your own food in you know if you're a patient and also as a, a mother of a child who's been in hospital um it's it's a it's not great food a lot of the mm -hmm. time and um and you think how important food is for gut health and how it has such far-ranging effects on you know your skin your spiritual tract your mood your brain your response to medication you know, it's just so important i just think we need to to do better and yeah. we need to understand it more and and to to really optimize our gut health as it's the foundation of everything yeah no i, I totally agree there, there is some work i'm holding my breath for it well i'm not i would say i'm not holding my breath for it because we've seen a number of hospital reviews in the past but there's something quite special about this one so Philip Shelley was the um, chair of the recent hospital review that started pre-pandemic. And obviously it's had a whole bunch of, you know, delays with everything going on. Um, but they have made some really, really interesting suggestions. Uh, something that I'm getting involved in is the NHS Chef Award of the Year. So it's basically to highlight innovation and excellence in NHS catering in, in the, the public sector environment. And so they're showcasing a whole bunch of different chefs from different regions looking at how they're collaborating across dietitians and nurses as well as patient support groups as well to deliver safe uh, delicious food that's actually healthy as well and I think my sort of contribution is a trying to prop them up as much as possible but also feeding them a bit of knowledge about you know, the gut mm. microbiota uh, increasing fiber intake all these different things that the dietitians will be saying as well but again just hearing it from a frontline clinician, I think, just sticks it in a little yeah. different way. Um, so th there are some things happening, I think. Um, we're probably a little bit further away from like sauerkraut being served on the side of a, of a hostel tray, but you know, we can only dream. I one hope day. so. I hope one day. <laughs> yeah, I hope one day.
<laughs> definitely, definitely. Well, Dr. Harriet, thank you so much for coming back on the pod. This is brilliant. Uh, as always, you're such a fountain of knowledge. And um, uh, I'll, I'll have to, I will join your pod. I'm sure I, I will definitely come on your podcast, but um, it, it seems to be doing really well uh, regardless. Oh, thank you. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's always a pleasure coming and talking. So thank you so much for inviting me.